Good afternoon and welcome to the inaugural Hearst Community Initiative Town Hall Speaker Series. My name is Evan Zislis. I'm the Director of Community Engagement for the Aspen Institute's Hearst Community Initiative. The work of HCI is focused on promoting dialogue, increasing understanding, and facilitating opportunities for meaningful collaboration among the communities of Aspen to Parachute, Colorado, located on ancestral lands of the Northern Ute Tribe. Today is the seventh event of an eight-part speaker series in a collaboration with the regional public libraries and chambers of commerce of Aspen, Basalt, Carbondale, Glenwood Springs, Newcastle, Silt, Rifle, and Parachute. Every two weeks from now until the end of July, you can tune in to learn more about the issues facing our communities and the local experts working to find collaborative solutions to the shared challenges of our region. Today's topic is the past, present, and future of ranching in Western Colorado, co-hosted by the Rifle Branch Library and the Western Garfield County Chamber of Commerce. Today's Zoom host is Garfield County Libraries, and interpretation to Spanish is brought to you by Velasco Language Services. Um, Alex, I'd love to turn it over to you to give us instructions for selecting English and Spanish. Thank you, and thank you everybody for being here. If you allow me a moment to share my screen, I will take you through our Zoom webinar functions. To mention this is a Zoom webinar uh, format. We have a couple of options to communicate with each other. We have a chat menu. If you have any quick comments to make, or if you need any help, with any technical issues during the presentation, please, please use the chat and I will go ahead and help you out as soon as I can. We also have a Q&A function. This is where you would put in your questions if you have one for the facilitator or our presenters today. The Q&A form will save your questions for a later time so that we can answer those at a, an appropriate time in the presentation. Finally, we do have uh, interpretation going on simultaneously for this presentation. At the bottom right of your Zoom options, you should see a gridded globe icon. Go ahead and push that and then uh, pick the language of your preference, English or Spanish. If you are getting any feedback, go ahead and mute the original audio. Again, if you need any help with any of these functions throughout the presentation, let me know through our chat. Back to Evan. As Alex mentioned, please use the chat feature for technical questions. And you may ask questions for our panel using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We'll leave time at the end to answer as many questions as possible. We have a lot of ground to cover, so I want to introduce our esteemed panel for today's discussion, starting with uh, Brackett and Wayne Pollard. Brackett is a second generation cattle rancher and a commercial lender with Bank of Colorado in Rifle. After graduating from Rifle High School, Brackett joined the US Air Force. He graduated from Colorado State University with a degree in agricultural business and from Oklahoma State University with a master's in entrepreneurship and emerging enterprises. Brackett also serves as president of the Holy Cross Cattlemen's Association and is the chairman of the Garfield County Energy Advisory Board. Wayne Pollard, is Brackett's father. Wayne is a lifelong resident of, of Rifle and Silt area and has considerable experience in Western Colorado livestock industries. Wayne has worked for over 46 years in local agriculture and has been a consultant around mineral rights, water rights, as well as successful methods, practices, and marketing strategies for livestock and crop production. Next, we have uh, Nicholas Crick. Nicholas is a Western Slope native, after college, he and his wife, Amy, moved to Australia. In 2014, they returned to join his wife's family's expanding ranching operation in Newcastle. Today, Nick, Amy, and their son, Oliver, are partners in Amy's family beef cattle operation. They also have a, a meat business offering high quality pasture raised beef direct to consumers. Nick is striving to be a better grazer, creating healthy soils, healthy plants, healthy animals, and healthy customers. Also, we're joined by Jose Miranda. Jose grew up on a water buffalo dairy in central Venezuela. He received a scholarship to Montana State University 
earned degree earned a degree in animal and range sciences, and then moved to Carbondale, Colorado, where he worked as a ranch hand and foreman at the historic Tybar Ranch. In 2016, Jose established the rocking TT Bar, the Roaring Fork Valley's first water buffalo herd, which he still owns and manages with his partner, Aaron Cusio, owner and operator of Aaron's Acres Farm. Uh, lastly, we had a, a last minute addition, which I'm thrilled to um, introduce Lydia Labelle de Rios, uh, who's the rangeland management span uh, specialist for the US Forest Service. Lydia is responsible for the largest rangeland program, program on the White River National Forest in Colorado. Her work is primarily in agriculture, international development and rangeland management, currently focusing on practical rangeland monitoring techniques and people management with the US Forest Service. She's worked in Ethiopia and recently returned from a, a sabbatical in Mongolia, where she, where she consulted on range management. Lydia has a bachelor degree in rangeland ecology and a master's in watershed science with a focus on international development. We're honored to have everyone joining us today. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Everybody's good? Okay. So first I wanna dig into everyone's personal experience, how you got here, uh, and what your background is in ranching. Uh, uh, Brackett, can we start with, uh, actually, Wayne, if we, if, if we could, can you tell us a little bit about your, your uh, ranching experience and, and how we've gotten here? Well, <clears throat> I was, like I said, I was born and raised in this area, and my family's been ranching in this area since 1912. So I guess you consider me a native. And as far as uh, I started, I actually had my first agricultural job when I was in the seventh grade at the rifle sale barn, which was the livestock marketing uh, facilities in the area. I then went to uh, uh, NJC Northeastern Junior College in Sterling in a livestock judging scholarship. And then in 75, I returned home to help uh, my father and uh, with a small ranching operation at that time and have just continually developed the size and, and uh, enterprise of the operation that we have now. And Brackett, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your experience, how, how you've gotten to where we are now? Sure, yeah, you know, I basically, I was raised on the ranch here <clears throat> and so really started at a young age but didn't get real serious about ranching as a business until, oh, probably uh, later in life once I was done with all of my schooling. And then at that point, uh, it just seemed like there was a lot of opportunity at that time to go ahead and get in and, and try to make a go of it. And, and what is your involvement with the ranch now, Brackett? Uh, so I, I help my dad run cattle and I, I own cattle myself. So it's kind of a partnership with me my dad and my sister and we uh, we all run cattle together, um, both on private, leased, and public ground, uh, both north and south of the rifle area. Um, Nicholas, I wonder, can you tell us a little bit about your experience in ranching and, and uh, how you found yourself where you are today? So I... Um wasn't born on a ranch, but I married a lovely woman who grew up on uh, a ranch whose folks are first generation ranchers in the area. And kind of after, throughout high school and college coming home, I spent time working on, on that ranch and we ended up getting married and tried to get away, but there's a pretty good draw to the area. And we came back in 2014 to partner with Amy's folks as they were continuing to grow and expand and expand their land base and their cattle herd. So that's kind of how I got into it. And where's their herd? So they started their ranch um, on Divide Creek. And this has been probably 45 years ago, the two of them. Uh, bought the land and the herd and grew from there and now they've expanded to uh, Grass Valley which is where I am and where I'm a partner and 
have expanded further to a property on Silt Mesa. So we have essentially three different cow herds that are on those different ranches. And Jose, same question. Uh, t tell us a little bit about your experience, a little bit different, um, but tell us how you, how you find yourself where you are today. So today I have a startup small herd of uh, water buffalo, not bison, water buffalo, it's in the Asian water buffalo. And um, I have started this in Colorado just by chance. I ended up here because of my ex-wife being from here. And because of the situations in Venezuela, uh, ended up uh, the way they did economically and politically. So I had to raise my family here and that's how I became a citizen. Um, <clears throat> although I grew up in a water buffalo ranch in Venezuela, I'm in a way kind of a, a, a beginner farmer or beginner rancher uh, here in the US. So got, although I was born in a ranch and had the agricultural background, I find myself in a very much startup mode again. And Lydia, same question. I know you're with the U.S. Forest Service, but tell us a little bit about, about your ranching background. Actually, um, I started my career here with cattle, um, cattle ranching about 15 years ago. I came from New England, which was traditional dairy. And so I've been working with many of these folks on this panel um, for, yeah, the last 15 years. And so felicidades, Jose, welcome. I, uh, it's exciting it's nice to see. new uh, endeavor, and then I'm just very delighted to be working with the Pollards and Nick Crick. I mean, they are fabulous stewards in the land, and I'm very delighted to be part of this conversation. And thank you to Carver County and Aspen Institute to be doing this work because um, education is key, and um, working together um, for the future of all of us. Thanks. Well, I, I, I want to start with something that you just said. Um, I consider ranchers uh, preeminent stewards of Colorado's dynamic landscape and the landscape is changing. Um, we, we all had an opportunity, or most of us had an opportunity to touch base a little bit last week. And one of the, the biggest challenges that we're seeing right now, uh, and one of the most dynamic factors that is changing the landscape right in front of our eyes is, is uh, our climate and the weather and uh, this, this desertification or drought that we're seeing. Um, I wonder, uh, and I just want to kind of popcorn around a little bit. Um, what what are you seeing? What are the changes that you're that you're seeing specifically around drought? Um, and what uh, ways are you mitigating those factors? Uh, we can start with anybody that that wants to jump in. <clears throat> One of the things that we did is that we realized that because of the drought the feed situation was going to be different. So we actually reduced the size of our cow herd somewhat and uh, uh, increased as much as we possibly could the availability of the grazing land that we might have. So we did it in two different fashions to increase availability, availability of forage and decrease the number of animals that needed to be using this forage. Nick, what, what, what are you doing to mitigate some of the drought that you're seeing? Uh, similarly, we did um, reduce a little bit of our herd, um, culling, you know, the bottom end of some of those animals to lessen the impact on our pasture, but also we implemented some migratory high intensity grazing, uh, which we put a large number of cattle into smaller grazing cells using electric fence and moved them daily or sometimes twice a day to keep them on fresh feed and to better utilize that forage base, um, which we expect is also gonna help um, help improve that pasture, um, giving it a longer rest and then coming back, the opportunity for it to regrow. And that, that helped us this year, for example, compared to last year, we were able to have 
pretty much the same number of cattle on the same land base. And when we took them to the summer high country, we actually have a lot of pasture remaining this year as compared to last year. So that's been our primary tool is, is keeping the cattle in smaller sections and moving them daily. And that's helped us a lot, especially on a tough year like this. Jose, you've got a little bit of a smaller herd. Um, t tell us what you're doing to mitigate some of that drought. So, because I rely on uh, private land that I lease uh, through all different areas in the valley. So I, I'm relying more heavily on higher elevation ground this year. I also have been a little more careful uh, when selecting uh, these different grounds that I lease kind of taking a, a deeper vision as to what the water rights are and what the water volume is and if they can really have enough water to irrigate that pasture to make it really worth my time and effort to move the animals to a different location, make sure that it's really gonna, gonna fulfill the needs of the herd. Uh, my biggest concern in regard to, to the drought at this moment is that I have I've been seeing how slowly the hay production in this valley has been uh, reduced um, and people that I used to rely to buy hay from now are even themselves buying hay from outside the valley. So that is, that is really a, a very big obstacle we have ahead of us, having such a large, uh, uh, long winters uh, where the demand for hay is so high. Um, another obstacle in that regard is that now we are competing for hay prices with horses, so that, that kind of raises the price. So that is another obstacle is the, the cost of hay. Not only is it coming from outside, but it's also competing with, with uh, people that are willing to pay higher price for hay. So from my business standpoint is uh, I can take the most advantage of my animals can bring the higher profit is when they graze. So having the most land available to graze, you know, even if I have to go farther, ends up being a, a more a smart a business move. Lydia, you're a, you're a graze consultant. I wonder, can you talk a little bit about um, these strategies and, and how your recommendations have shifted with, with the, uh, the climate? Absolutely. Um, and I'd like to say that uh, Nick spoke a little bit about high intensity, short duration, and that can be very useful. Unfortunately, we don't always have that um, opportunity on public land, on lands, but we can do it on private and that can help a lot. So that is an opportunity there. We look at the frequency, intensity, and duration of time. And we have um, each allotment and area they graze broken into pastures. So of the 300,000 acres that, I'm, that I oversee, I mean, the experts are my ranchers. And what we often do is we'll modify um, movement around the water and around the vegetation based on the rains and based on what's happening. So um, in this situation, we've taken some of these strategies and we'll say, for example, if the on time is June 16th and we're in a pasture normally for 10 days, um, if we have to modify and move out faster, then we'll move into a different pasture. Time. So we work together. There's a lot of collaboration and communication and lots of writing and lots of um, monitoring that goes on throughout a year, especially in uh, extreme droughts such as the we're in now. I wonder, could you, Lydia, could you, you've, you've been uh, doing this work internationally. Can you talk a little bit about what some other countries uh, are doing to get ahead of similar circumstances? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, unfortunately, they really don't have some of the luxuries that we have. Um, we're one of the few countries in the world that can manage the ground that we do and to even have public lands. Um, like for example, in parts of Ethiopia, they're really just kind of getting their feet underneath them in regards to pasture management and what that looks like. Um, in parts of Africa, they, other parts of Africa, um, they do use that high intensity short duration. Um, and again, it just depends on, it's site specific, moisture specific, um, the whole ecosystem and how it is uh, resilient based on those factors. And so, um, yes, they will use um, different strategies that we use, but we've also implemented some of this high intensity, or excuse me, the frequency, duration, and um, uh, intensity uh, types of, of uh, grazing strategies. So it's called, um, it's an index that we use, 
And it's something that can be as simple as throwing a hat on the ground when they turn into a pasture and looking at the vegetation. Of course, you have to know your species. And then um, when you leave that pasture, you using that same area, you can also um, take that same backdrop and that same background. And that's a very simplified, pragmatic um, method that you can use anywhere in the world. The idea is getting people to do it, uh, making sure that people are focused on taking time to really monitor uh, those pastures. So um, in Mongolia, um, they still are very, very fresh um, and even just um, land tenure. And so um, at this point, you know, pastoralists will just come up upon each other. One goes right, one goes left. Um, you know, you're talking about, you know, you're talking about 3 million people to 40 million livestock. So it's very different. Um, it's still very, um, it's, it's very, very um, new still for them to even consider some of these things. So I feel that we're very uh, blessed actually to be able to do um, some of the work that we do, especially in times of drought like this, that we have the ability to work together to look at uh, solutions um, for our ranchers. I think one of the reasons for us to, to pick ranching as a topic for this town hall series is so that our neighbors outside of the industry and in, within the region, I mean, as we're Aspen to parachute. So what, what my hope was so that people that are not ranchers and people that are not informed about ranching um, get to understand what their friends and neighbors are, are uh, how they're contributing to the stewardship of the land, um, how they're contributing to the local economy, uh, what is the reliance on, on the ranching industry as, a, as a, uh, an important factor in uh, our local economy and our regional economy. I wonder uh, if, you, if, if, if you could all kind of discuss briefly the nuances of how you see uh, local ranching having an impact on our, our region. Uh, and I'll start with Wayne and Brackett. Yeah, sure. So the so really, I think they say that somewhere around five hundred to six hundred dollars per cow that is is outstanding in the field here in our area. Um, that money goes into our local economy. So not only just the cattle and the multiplier effect that there is, but it's also a uh, like an upcycling in the fact that a lot of the land that we have in this rough and dare and arid desert. Uh, climate is not able to produce anything besides uh, a grazable uh, grass that then cattle or sheep or water buffalo or really any type of livestock can take that and convert it into a consumable protein. And so not only, are, not only does it pump money into the economy just by the natural, uh, by the natural economics of it, but there's also like an upcycling effect in the fact that it, we take water, sunshine, arid dirt, and turn it into a consumable protein that really is not farmable um, in any other way. You, you can't harvest it in any other way besides livestock grazing. Uh, Nick and Jose, do you have anything to add? What, what is the impact of local ranching on our, our regional economy? I agree with, with uh, what he was saying, and also, um, it, I, I see like when you first fra frame the question, I, I see it's actually kind of the other way around. I see a, an impact also from the community towards the local community. Like I see an uh, increase of awareness of the local community into the importance of having this local farming community alive, and it's kind of part of the reason why I'm. I've been able to be successful here is because people have helped me along the ways in different different ways you know from access to land to affordable housing to be able to live in this place so there's there's many ways that i feel like like the 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 <clears throat> the it goes both ways you know farmers have been helping the community the communities that have become aware of the importance have been helping those local farmers so it creates kind of a symbiosis in those communities that have been able to stay healthy with their ag communities nick do you have anything to add yeah 
And to be honest, I'm not as up to speed maybe as the direct impacts that uh, we might have on the economy. But um, a couple things that, that I think we add as uh, ranchers to our local area is the opportunity for some of these beautiful open spaces that draw people here. Uh, for example, when we're irrigating our pastures or um, our hay fields and things like that, it, it provides a, a beautiful green landscape and people, like, uh, there's probably a term used to describe that, a, a viewscape or some something like that that would, that that is one of kind of those unmeasurable impacts that I think we have that's positive for the area and that draws people here. We have uh, recreation is growing as you know and and um, where my ranch is here we get dozens of cyclists uh, like every day there's a cyclist just they choose to drive on a road because it, they can see the cows or they can see the sheep and the green fields and the sprinklers going and and that's not something that people would necessarily consider with um, that a ranch provides the community. Uh, Lydia, do you have um, numbers? And additionally, I guess. Okay. Go ahead. Sorry, I'm speaking over you. No, that's all right. Go ahead. Finish your thought. Um, the other thing that. Um, more economically related, um, my wife and I have um, a direct-to-consumer meat business where we aim to market our beef to local consumers. That's kind of our goal is to be able to sell as much beef as we can to people that we know and we can hand it to them and say, yes, this, this animal lived its life here. It was raised here and um, we raised it and we want to share it with our community so and that obviously is a direct economic relationship so Lydia do you have numbers of figures on um, agritourism the growth of agritourism in our region oh you're on mute sorry if I had a dollar for every time I did that <laughs> um, um, I do I don't have current numbers but I just quickly googled something and this is Something just, you know, in 95, they talked about cash receipts for marketing the cattle in 11 of the Western states, and it totaled 7.3 billion US. Uh, that was the Department of Agriculture. So that's some time ago now. So you know that it's a lot larger than that at this point, but it's a number. If people are fixed on numbers, it's a number. But I kind of agree with some of the other comments in the sense that ranching is not always in about um, the dollar. Um, I mean, of course it is. I mean, you have to have a, you have to have um, you have to have a profit. Um, but I'm thinking in terms of other people, the other, you know, resources and the folks that are out there, they have to understand how we all are collectively um, integrated. For example, if we have, a, you know, um, search and rescue, we have anything that happens on the ground. The first people we go to are our ranchers. We most, most inev inevitably cannot find these people without locals that know where they're going and what they're doing. And to know some of these, one allotment alone is 60,000 acres. And let's just face it, we don't know that. And if we don't have each other to solve these issues that are growing, because we've got so many recreationists out there. And so um, there's an education piece that comes with it. And this is just one of the lists that I could go on um, about invasive species management and the fact that these folks are out there doing that. Um, they're doing that because they know it's good for the ground. So they're doing that on top of all of their other um, commitments, you know, whether it's hanging, um, getting feed to the market, you know, um, their own family commitments, um, you know, all the things that go around um, agriculture and what it involves in seven days a week with no days off. Um, the amount of, and the values that come out of some of these folks, um, you know, that, you know, just hardworking folks, you know, just it's I mean, I say it from this point of view, because I, I get the luxury of being right in the middle. And I love the education piece. And um, like, you just can't put a dollar on it. And I think people can identify that. There are some things you just can't put a dollar on and this type of work. Um, of course, but they at the same time, need to make a living. And um, when you've got some, of, uh, you know, I just talked to a few people came off the mountain right before this meeting. And when they're normally pulling a thousand bales of hay and you only pull, you know, can only pull 250, 
that's that's a problem. That's a problem for them. That's a problem for us. And it's a trickle effect. So it affects all of our communities. And, and it's really important to understand those bottom dollars, but it takes time and education too. Hopefully well, that helps. Let's talk about conflicting interests. Uh, one of the things that's come up quite a bit recently uh, is some of the geopolitics uh, uh, kind of coming out of the legislature. Um, can we talk a little bit about um, uh, whether it's a real or a perceived anti-livestock sentiment? Uh, and we're seeing a little bit of that in, in some, some recent legislation and, and that, that anti-livestock, I'm putting that in air quotes because that, that was the way that it was described to me that there's this sentiment um, associated with legislation that, that potentially does conflict with um, not just the ranching ideology and the ranching ethos and the ranching lifestyle, but also operational practices. Um, can we talk a little bit about the, re the reintroduction of wolves? Uh, and I would love to just get your, your feelings about that from, from Wayne and Brackett. What's the impact of the reintroduction of wolves? Well, one of the things that I kind of see coming down the, the road is the fact that uh, there was a reason why they eliminated the wolf in this area 100 years ago. And because of our terrain, the natural uh, food supply for the wolves in the summertime, it is in the higher elevations. But in the winter, when the snow starts to drive that, those animals down, they're going to find these wolves right down here in the valleys uh, interacting with the uh, with people, and uh, and so there's going to be a situation there where they're going to find that it isn't quite as simple as what they initially thought. The other thing too is that was what was kind of interesting is that uh, Western Colorado, <clears throat> uh, it's my understanding there wasn't any counties that voted it in, and even Eastern Colorado, but it was basically the uh, uh, front range counties that, that basically voted it in, but yet they're not wanting to reintroduce the wolves in their area. But so it's kind of one of those catch 22s. And, and you know, it's, it's going to be one of those things, it's going to be hard to determine until it actually happens for us to, because right now anything I say is strictly speculation, because who knows. But the, uh, if you put any common sense thought to it, 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 could come in, come back to be a real issue for the entire state. Yeah, and, and not to get too political, right? And so we, we understand as ranchers that this is now something we have to manage and is something we have to, to kind of deal with going forward. And we respect the political process in our state. Um, but just like my dad said, I, I think there are gonna be conflicts um, but it may not be so much as what we think is it being ranchers versus wolves or, or people who are in favor of wolves versus ranchers, as it may come to be similar to the, the issues we have with bears and mountain lions coming into our communities. So it may become more of an issue for people in, in kind of areas like Aspen and Glenwood Springs, these areas where bears and mountain lions are already starting to kind of come in because that we're basically expanding out into their natural environment. Um, Nick, do you have any thoughts on, on wolf reintroduction? Yeah, I think for me, the most frustrating uh, thing about it is that, as I'm sure you guys are aware, we, we did, uh, officially observe and record that uh, in Northern Colorado, there were two adults with pups uh, discovered and photographed in Colorado. So those animals ended up here probably from some of the other uh, states reintroduction programs. So what that says to me is we have, we already have these animals here and they've come here naturally based on the previous reintroduction or migrated here and I, I feel like it's a big waste of time money energy and resources to try and continue to push this um, introduction process when when they're here 
and, and, and as ranchers, I, we're, we're pretty good at um, managing things. So we will find a way to make it work. But um, I think the political side of, of the issue is most frustrating to me. Jose? <clears throat> I'll follow up on that. Um, and yes, I think the, the discussion is not whether the wolf is coming or <laughs> how it's coming. The discussion has to be from the, the rancher community perspective is how those ranches that are going to be neighboring the wolf populations are going to get reimbursed for their losses. How are their uh, consumers going to really support those farmers and ranchers that are dealing with wolves by paying more by, to those products that have a stamp? from farms that come from areas that deal with wolves. I think that's, that's kind of where the discussion has to be moving forward. And I think it's going to be a better use of our time and resources. Um, and that's different than the discussion that is coming forward with this, with this, uh, this other bill that had to do with the humane treatment of animals that is so out of touch with reality. It had nothing to do with, with this. This situation with the wolf, to me, is more of a moral imperative that we have. If we brought a, a, a species almost to extinction and we have the capacity to bring it back, I think we have the moral imperative to do so and reimburse and, and, and help those that are going to be dealing with those uh, consequences, help them out. Uh, in regards to this future bill that is this coming, it's unbelievable that it even made it that far because it's in total a, a total total uh, uh, out, of, out of touch with reality with what really it takes to farm. And um, it will be very damaging. And although I'm a, I, I consider myself to be kind of a, a organic farmer and against industrial agriculture, that's very different than what this bill proposes. You know, this, this bill is, is a total absurd that we probably have to discuss an item at a time just to kind of uh, explain to the consumers what the reality is for each one of the, of the specific items that they're proposing. So before we get too much into Prop 16, um, if, if I could go to Lydia and just give us a, give us a brief background on Prop 16 uh, and then tell us what the US Forest Service's uh, position on it is, if you can, uh, and then we'll, we'll get feedback from the panel. Actually, I can't at all. I can only okay. say that we will work um, collaboratively um, with whatever decision comes our way. Um, and we will definitely listen to all the uh, proponents and constituents on both sides and, um, and mitigate um, as needed. So can you, can you share with us your, your understanding of what Prop 16 is about for those that are not familiar with the bill? Um, actually, um, I think I'm going to go ahead and just and leave it at that. And yeah. um, but if you want to talk, well, you guys can continue to chat about it as much as you want. Um, but I'm going to do my best just to stay as neutral as possible. I'm happy to. to that's why I started with. You. That's why I started with you, Lydia. But go, bracket, go ahead. Yeah. So basically, Proposition 16, it was actually struck down by the Supreme Court. So it's not going to make it onto the ballot now. But basically, what it was 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 some kind of unsensical, uh, in my opinion, uh, bannings on different uh, practices that we use in agriculture, particularly in livestock agriculture. Um, one, of the, one of the most damaging, uh, say from a economic standpoint, it was likely going to be having to carry an animal to 20% of its expected life cycle. So basically you wouldn't be able to slaughter a cow until they were five years old. Um, and, and just basically the pure, the economics behind that, uh, we've gotten very efficient in our, in our agricultural production systems um, to be able to basically at two years uh, process an animal and turn that into a consumable protein for, our, for the public. Um, and if we had to start trying to figure out how to take an animal to five years before being able to harvest it, um, the, the economics behind that are just, uh, they just don't add up. So that was one of the, the ones that was difficult. And then there would just be uh, basic practices, um, veterinarian practices that are very common and approved by a wide, a wide variety of uh, veterinarians as proper animal husbandry um, that would also become um, 
um, illegal. And so uh, it was just kind of a, uh, an attack in general on the livestock sector. Wayne, do you have anything to add? Well, that was basically the whole gist of it. <clears throat> the thing that, uh, you, it was so radical that it was basically very obvious that they really wanted to just eliminate the livestock industry in Colorado because it would have taken away all the packing houses. It would have taken away the bulk of your veterinaries, veterinarians because it was going to uh, ban the uh, uh, spaying and, and altering of, of even dogs and cats. And that was one of the reasons that it uh, got voted down because it wasn't specific enough. Well, they can come back and be very specific now as far as to the industry. Nick, do you have more to add? I think it's pretty much been covered. Um, my wife is a large animal veterinarian as well. Um, and this would, it would have impacted a lot of uh, just industry standard practices for her um, being able to detect a pregnancy, which most ranchers uh, do that as part of their normal operation. And ultimately, like Wayne said, it, the livestock industry in Colorado would, would be gone if, if this was allowed to go through, so. Yeah, go ahead, Lydia. One thing I will say is this, it goes right back to education. Um, we need to educate so many people about all these ins and outs of this, um, this profession. And there's just so many people that don't realize what goes into it. And that's what results in some of these proposals. And so people need to be educated. We need to take the time to do that in whatever platform and way that we can um, so we can all be uh, reasonable. Thank you. One of the things um, that I would love to discuss a little bit is the nuance between large livestock industry operations and small operations, small family uh, owned operations. Uh, for people that are not real familiar with the, the difference or the nuances between what's the difference between a big feedlot and something that is, um, you know, grass fed, for example, uh, or, you know, holistic grazing practices that, that, we've, that we've discussed what the differences are between a family owned operation uh, with a reasonably small herd and some of these, some of these giant feedlot operations. Uh, I wonder, uh, we'll kind of go through the panel here just to give us a little bit of, of your perspective on the, the differences between some of those giant uh, operations and, and small locally owned uh, family owned operations. Uh, we we'll start with uh, Brackett and Wayne. You know, Evan, it's it's hard for me to. Uh, well, let's put it this way: I feel like there's a, a place for everyone in this industry, right? I I believe that whether you have a large feedlot that is considered maybe more of a uh, industrial type farming operation or industrial type agriculture, I mean, I one one thing that nobody can argue is how efficiently that we as cattle producers or livestock producers in the U.S. produce livestock, whether it's through genetic improvements or uh, feed efficiencies or cost of gain or just those kind of things, or even our efficiencies in packing plants. Um, nobody can argue with the efficiencies in our, in our industry. I, I believe that there are uh, certain people who desire to eat meat that they maybe know where it came from. And so like, you know, whether it be like Nick and Amy's deal or Jose's deal, there, there's, there's a sector for that. But I, I can't really uh, start throwing uh, fire at the larger people who have become so efficient in what they do, because technically without them, um, you know, there, there's likely to be far more hunger in the U.S. and the world in general. And so, I don't know, I think one of the most impressive things about America is how efficient our uh, food systems are. 
See, I think one of the, to add to that too is that <clears throat> the uh, the actual ag population is about two percent, so we are definitely a minority also. But when I was a young man <clears throat> in this area, probably ninety uh, percent of the land mass was in agriculture. However, because of the economics, as as time progressed, each small, I mean, each operation had to be split up so they could go ahead and and uh, pay their debt that they needed. Also, it became very uh, clear that a lot of the fa uh, family members that they had, such as in my case, like Rackett and Page that are still part of the, but for them to actually still be part of agriculture, they had to go get a job somewhere else. Rackett's now a banker. Page is now a, a real estate professional. Yes, I'm, I'm uh, still in the ranching uh, part of it, but it's going to come to it. You know, it all comes down to economics. And as far as uh, like Brackett was saying, that the efficiency that the American agricultural industry is, has got to, where we're so, like he said, just so efficient, it makes it, if we didn't have that efficiency, there would be some real issues with hunger, even in the United States. Nick, do you have any thoughts on that? I, I agree with Pollard's there. Um, one thing that I, I think maybe doesn't get uh, translated to the public is um, often us who we have these small family operations and, and our cow herds, um, and in a lot of cases, um, we sell a calf crop to certain buyers that maybe are buying for a feedlot or, or for a stalker operation or something. So a lot of our, un, our animals that are not ready for market will go elsewhere to, to be brought up to a market weight. And in our area, that is a, it's a really, it's a big challenge to take an animal all the way from birth into a finished weight to a marketed product. So I, I, as an industry, we, we do rely on, on, on these other um, types of operations to make, to make the food supply supplied. So um, it, it's just, a, it's a, dynamic, challenging industry, and we do rely on each other because, I mean, the feed yard needs the calves and the calf producer needs the feed yard. Jose, you've got uh, water buffalo. I wonder, is there is there anything that you'd like to add considering your unique perspective? Well, I wanted to say something first in regards to this. It is true that the, the feed law have become incredibly efficient at uh, produce, you know, finishing cattle, uh, very inexpensive, but that's, that's been done at the cost of the environment, you know, and nobody's paying for that. So that's, that's where my issue is in that regard. We have a serious unbalance on the rangeland that is not being grazed. And then at the same time, we have high concentration of cattle in overloads of urine and manure and parasites. So to me, that is something that needs to be fixed in the future. It is, it is such a thing that they have become so efficient at it that we have become, the industry has become dependent on them to finish the animal. But the reality is that, that it is the industrial act that depends on small farmers because they have been unsuccessful at integrating the whole, the whole change like they did with pork or they did with poultry. They have not been able to be successful at that with cattle, fortunately. <clears throat> but that is a problem that needs to be addressed. So until we really put a, a dollar value on the cost of uh, the nature that is being damaged by the industrial ag, then that, that efficiency in production is, is a fake number in my mind. <clears throat> in regards to the water buffalo per se, you know, the water buffalo are still very far behind in the U.S., but water buffalo are the number one most relied upon domestic animal in the world. And uh, it is in very few places where they are in confined into a feedlot scenarios. 
most of the water buffaloes are raised uh, in the world, just in their natural environment, just grazing. And that's something that I think that we need to strive towards. And I believe that to compete with feedlots and how cheap they're able to produce that, that nobody can compete with, I think it's a matter of providing some, some kind of incentive. You know, the feedlots have all kinds of subsidies, but there's no incentives at all that can help somebody like Nicolas to finish his product on grass and take it all the way to the market, you know, so that way he can compete with the big feedlots that are taking advantage of all kinds of subsidies that the small producers cannot take, take advantage of. So although they might be more efficient, the, the, the playing field is not level. Yeah, you know, I would, I would tend to agree with him on, on some of that and disagree on other parts. I mean, I think when I say efficient, basically what I'm getting at is that we're able to uh, basically keep a food supply that instead of all of us having to like raise our own food and, the, and like that, that basically we can have food available really. And I, and I, this is not going to whether it's like the, the most nutritious or healthy way, but it basically gives Americans freedom to pursue other opportunities because one of the last things they worry about right now is the, is food. And then here in our area, one of the reasons why it's difficult for us in this area to finish cattle with with a desirable you know there's a, a a desire worldwide for grain finished beef because of the flavor and and how good it tastes and so that is one of the things that that it, they're just meeting a demand there but what we do really well in this area is raise cows and calves on on grasses that are uh they come up in the summertime we're able to whether it be yearlings or cows and calves, turn them out on public resources, graze those public resources, even if it's private resources. But that is something we do very well in this area. The one thing we don't do very well is um, finish them to a to a um, to where we can process them and then pr basically provide a uh, sustainable protein for consumers. Also, when I was a young man in the 1970s, <clears throat> that's when the ag industry really started to concentrate. That's when the feedlots really got bigger and, and what have you. And they were trying to industrialize the entire industry. But the one sector that they never could get efficient in was the cow-calf sector because they just couldn't get enough uh, there were just too many variables in the cow-calf part, which would also be something that you'd be familiar with, that, um, that they could never get efficient other than just having people, you know, personally being able to take care of it. That's why the, the over 50% of the cow, uh, cow herd in the United States is in herds of 50 head or less is because that's where they have to keep that efficiency is in the small herds versus the bigger herds. Easy, easier to manage, so to speak. And, and uh, cow-calf is hard to scale where, you know, obviously a feedlot can scale up really quickly and become very large very quickly uh, because of economies of scale. Lydia, what did, what did you have to add? Oh, I was just going to make some comments. I mean, really, the Forest Service has focused on the resource, the graminoids, the grasses, and, you know, the ecosystem of it all. But it just occurred to me, you know, that really, you know, for every action, there's a reaction. And taking one piece of that puzzle out, you know, large versus small, you know, there are going to be impacts. Um, you know, but again, listening to everybody on the panel, there, there might be some opportunity there. Um, but what that looks like, you know, it, it can't be a one and done. It's probably something that would have to be, you know, analyzed and worked through and kind of talked about over time of, you know, what are those, what's the end goal, right? But we do have that need for each other. And um, again, just like as an ecologist, everything depends on each other. Um, so, uh, but there, there's always a place to start. Um, but I will say just from some of the experience that I've had with the smaller operations versus the larger, there's benefits to both, right? Um, you know, just, and I'm just talking more of the, the ranchers I work with and the challenges that they have. Um, but sometimes you can give more attention when you have a smaller operation. Um, but larger operations, you may have more resources. Um, so it's just, it's just one of those. It's, I'm sure 
again, going back to the metaphor of the ecosystem, you know, when you take something out, you know, there's going to have a reaction to that. So it's something to think about big picture. I want to, I want to finish on a, a positive note. Um, and when we talk, when we think about challenges, I, I like to think about them in association with opportunities. Um, one, of, one of the challenges in the ranching industry is that people are retiring out. Uh, Wayne had mentioned this in an earlier conversation where um, I think you said uh, most, most of the historic ranchers are in their 60s and 70s. What are the ways uh, that, that you see us working to uh, promote and nurture the next generation of ranchers? Uh, and we'll start with uh, Brackett and Wayne. Well, the average age of, like I was telling you, the average age of the ranchers in the United States is 72. So that basically tells you that they're all, almost all ready to retire. The one good thing that we have around here is we do have the brackets and the nicks and the uh, different ones that are willing to step up and, and, and do some things. The thing that, and, and there is a lot of opportunity here. I, I see a lot of opportunity, but a lot of the opportunity is going to be you know, producing the, the meat here and being able to sell it here. We've talked about that in several of the panelists here today. But it, but until it becomes a uh, economically feasible for these people to go ahead and do that, it's going to be difficult. And so that's why we're also going to, one of the things that we're having as an issue, just the same as everybody else, is labor. But because of our industry starting to uh, reduce as much as it has. The uh, we've we actually have had to start bringing our workers in from from Mexico or in the H two A program to find people that are qualified to be able to do the type of work that we need them to do. You know the the experience of doing some of this work that's out there is becoming uh, very minimized. But there, right there in itself, there's another opportunity for somebody that kind of knows what they're doing to be able to do some teaching, to be able to create some, some, some businesses. You know, that's the one good thing about the United States that when there is a challenge, think somebody will come up with an idea to solve that challenge. And when they do, it generally has a very high uh, economic impact for that person. Look at the computer. I mean, look at the billionaires that were created out of a computer. And at the time it first started, they, it took an entire building to, to house one. Now we're talking to you on a little old laptop. Yeah, I, so like my dad said, you know, the, uh, I think like with Jose and Nick and I, and, and I commend them for a lot of the practices they do um, and raising their own beef. And I, and I definitely think that that's it. A, a way of the future and of the present. I mean, I know it's working now, um, but I also think that there, there will be a um, uh, future in this area with people who are, are good at managing rangelands with the Forest Service, because I, I believe that at some point the Forest Service will be, you know, sick of dealing with people who aren't willing to manage it properly. And so therefore people who are willing to do what it takes to manage that properly, uh, there, there'll be, be benefits there. Um, I, I think that all in all, uh, there are plenty of opportunities in the future. Um, I, I think a person just gotta be willing to work for it. Nick, what are your thoughts on the, the, the next generation of ranchers? What's the future of ranching look like? Well, there's no doubt that it's it's challenging, but as has been mentioned, challenges bring opportunity, and and I think those that are are willing to adapt and um, have a little bit of foresight and and see where where the trends are and where the markets are 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 going to be successful. It's it's a tough it's a tough uh, industry to be in, but you know, it is also very rewarding. So I guess I just want to keep a positive attitude as well. Um, and, and there is opportunity, so. Jose. 
Oh, I think that by nature, we farmers and ranchers are optimistic. Otherwise, we wouldn't last more than a year on this business. Um, I've, I think that there's opportunity in the changing markets. You know, the consumers are, are changing. And I think it's a matter of paying attention to that. And that motivated me to do what I'm doing is trying to find a niche market where I can fulfill uh, the needs of uh, a small group of consumer and kind of focus on that. Uh, there's opportunities for the same thing in all kinds of agricultural products, just finding a niche market and, and, and really connecting with, with your consumers. I think that's key. Um, um, I, I see also opportunity in the future, you know, with, with, the, with the changing uh, dynamics of uh, milk consumption, you know, how people are moving away from the industrial dairy to a lot of vegetable-based uh, milk. Uh, I'm not a fan of the vegetable milk at all myself, but I think that with the changes, it uh, has a lot to do with, with the industrial uh, agricultural setting. So, so moving to the plant-based doesn't really uh, totally fix that. Uh, and that's why I'm kind of a big uh, proponent of the idea of the mobile dairy and trying to to promote that in in, uh, in other places uh, because it kind of uh, integrates the whole rotational grazing, uh, uh, animal welfare, and healthy healthier product, uh, and it kind of opens the door for new producers to kind of get in it uh, because it's hard to compete against a big ad. Lydia, I want to give you the last word. There's so much. There's so much more to talk about. Uh, oh. in regards to innovation and um, technology and, and symbiosis with um, other industries. Uh, but Lydia, what, where do you see the, the future of ranching? You know, I also remain optimistic. Um, that's the only way I can be. Um, I do feel like we've um, got some amazing folks here and they're willing to be at the table. We used to say, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And so, uh, you know, making the time to be collaborative, making the time to work with Colorado State University and Extension, um, keeping our monitoring going, uh, getting on the ground together, um, bringing people um, to the table that maybe don't have the education and background in this. And so continuing to have those conversations, continuing to work together, looking for opportunity. Our forest supervisor says, you know, there's opportunity in chaos. And uh, it feels a little bit like that right now with drought and COVID and you know, but there are things that are going to come out of this and we just need to work together. Well, on that note, um, speaking of optimism, I'm, I'm in Car Carbondale, Colorado, and I hear rain outside. So um, hopefully you're all getting a little, a little moisture. Uh, I want to thank Brackett and Wayne Pollard, uh, Nicholas Crick, Jose Miranda, Lydia Labella de Rios um, for joining us today. Uh, thank you all for joining today's uh, inaugural Hearst Community Initiative Town Hall Speaker Series. This presentation was the seventh of eight webinar events broadcasting every two weeks through the end of July. You can register for the final event in this series at aspen2parachute.org slash events. Again, that's aspen, the number two, parachute.org slash events. Our last presentation will be Tuesday, July 27th from noon to 1 p.m. Mountain Time on the topic of uh, water in Aspen, a closer look at the Roaring Fork watershed and beyond featuring uh, uh, water reporter Luke Runyon from KUNC, Heather Sackett from Aspen Journalism, and Steve Hunter from the City of Aspen. And you can find more information on the Aspen Institute's initiatives to engage with the communities of the Roaring Fork and Colorado River Valleys at aspen2parachute.org. I'm Evan Zislis. Thank you again for joining us today, and we'll see you next time.